Again, good evening, brothers and sisters and all that are gathered here. May God bless this assembly tonight. I surely wish I'd have an opportunity to visit with all of you before you go home tonight, but I guess that won't happen. We have quite a few people here. But again, we want to just say that if there's somebody who would like to have a visit or would like to share a few words or you have a question, you are certainly welcome to uh, make that known to Brother Mary or to myself or to whoever that would be a appropriate person to uh, arrange things. The only reason why we're here is because of this work and because you're here. We didn't come to go snorkeling or go uh, moose hunting or sightseeing while we're here. We came for only one purpose. And uh, that's, why we, that's why we want to be here. I think tonight we'll sing in that song sheet you have in front of you there, maybe the first and the last verse. And it might not hurt if we'd stand to sing that tonight. The first and last verses of Immortal, Invisible, God Only Wise. I did want to call your attention to the fact that last night we sang the third verse. And as we sang that verse, you maybe did not think about it. But when you think of the Son of God being our life, he that hath the Son hath life. It said in that third verse, to all life thou givest, to both great and small, in all life thou livest. The true life of all. Tonight we'll sing the first and last stanzas. Immortal, invisible, God only wise, enlightened, accessible, hid from our eyes, most blessed, most glorious, the ancient of days, almighty, victorious, thy great name we praise. Great Father of glory, your Father of light, thine angels adore thee, all veiling their sight. All praise we would render, all help us to see. Tis only the splendor of light hideth thee. Amen. Yes, you may be seated. Thank you. We mentioned last night that we would like to bring a series of messages, maybe three or four, concerning John's understanding of revival, the Apostle John, and as he wrote it, and what we call the letter to uh, First John. We're not quite sure if that is a letter. It may have been a cyclic message sent to, to various churches. It seems like that's what it may have been. But be it a letter, be it a sermon, be it a message, be it from, from the heart of John, from the heart of God, from the heart of Jesus, this apostle of love, he understood this very, very well. And uh, there's much we can learn here, and there are far, far more than three or four messages could you bring from this, these five chapters, of this very important part of your Bible. 
There's far more than that that would affect revival. We cannot look at everything that's in there in this, these few nights. An important theme in 1 John, we discovered this last evening, we'll see more of it as we go along, is to be like Christ in a world of darkness and falsehood, where there is no light and where there is no salt. To be like Christ in this world. And so the disciple whom Jesus loved has no doubt that as he is, as Christ is, so can we also be here in this world. As Jesus walked, we walk. His life has become our own. We find this in John. Since we have within us the Son of God, we have the life of the Son. Because this life is in his Son. For the Apostle John, to know a spiritual truth is to believe it. And, and that's where John is different from many people. As soon as John knew a truth about God, he believed it. And so when you believe it, that's when it's mixed with faith, and that's when it then has power and promise in the lives that we daily live. This is why he is writing to us. He, he told us that. We noticed that last evening. Faith comes to those who hear, but not only to those who hear, but those who receive this message. They know that it is true. And when we know it's true, that we can experience it in daily life. And no person experiences anything in Christ that he cannot believe. Other people might experience it, but the person who does not believe does not. Uh, there's no use, use to pray for the salvation of a sinner if you don't believe God can do anything about it. That God's not interested, that God does not care, that God's on vacation, that God is not interested in that person. But, but, but we can only experience what we believe God for. And, and maybe God is answering that prayer, but not because I prayed it, maybe because somebody else did who believed what he was praying. We all heard their prayer request tonight. But it's those who believe. That's what John understood that we we're supposed to do. That's how we experience things in daily life. We believe it. This to John, as John understood it, is what he could called in his writing, it's what he called fellowship with God and with his son, Jesus Christ. You hear it. We touched it. We saw it. We heard it. We believed it. We had fellowship with him. It's what happens. This is not a text tonight, but I'm just going to turn you to this. It's in 1 John. It's in chapter 5. I'd like to read two verses here. Just to kind of summarize what I've said by these, in these introductory words. Chapter 5, verse 13. These things have I written unto you that believe on the name of the Son of God, that ye may know that ye have eternal life, and that ye may believe on the name of the Son of God. And then verse 20 says, And we know that the Son of God has come and hath given us an understanding that we may know him that is true, and we are in him that is true, even his Son, Jesus Christ. This is the true God and eternal life. It makes us think of what Jesus prayed in the Gospel of John, chapter 17, verse 3. This is life eternal, that they may know thee, the only true God, and Jesus Christ whom thou sent. It sounds like John, doesn't it? So with the doctrinal foundation established, as we've had it last night and up till now, we can look at Christ's earthly life and then believe that we can experience the eternal life that we see in him. We saw his humility. He came to this earth in perfect humility. There is no pride in God. And there's no reason for pride in us. We do not experience a low-lying mind by trying to erase the evidences of pride from our lives. So I have this eraser here. I think maybe there's something prideful around here someplace. Let's see if we can erase it. See if we can get rid of that. That won't work. Let's not comb our hair when we go to church.
Let's see if we can't bring some mud along into the church building on our shoes. We do, not, we do not experience a low-lying mind by trying to erase the evidence of pride from our lives, but by choosing to walk humbly with our God. It is as Daniel told Nebuchadnezzar, it's very interesting what he said to him, and I share this with you tonight because there's an important truth here. So I'm going to read to you in Daniel. This is in chapter 4. Daniel speaking to Nebuchadnezzar, he had had that. Very important dream. Verse 27. Wherefore, O king, let my counsel be acceptable unto thee, and break off thy sins by righteousness, and thy iniquities by showing mercy to the poor, if it may be to a lengthening of thy tranquility. We do not stop sitting by seeing how hard we can try to stop being bad. But by, by, but by being filled with the righteousness of God. It is not only necessary to put off the wrong, we must put on the new man created in righteousness and true holiness, as Ephesians tells us in chapter 4. So I'm going to go a step further and say tonight that humility permits us to live a holy life. Jesus will take away the sin in our hearts. He was sinless, he was spotless, he was holy, he was harmless. He's undefiled and separate from sinners. Is it possible for us to experience a holy life? And John is convinced that it is. So I want to speak to you tonight from this title, Cleansed from All Sin. And you can turn to 1 John chapter 1. Cleansed from All Sin. It's certainly a revival theme. It's certainly something we all need. This is somewhat of a difficult subject. It's kind of deep. It's a little bit doctrinal. I tried to spend some time today figuring out how to present a message like this to this congregation. I could be very easily misunderstood. Hardly any, most anything that I can say tonight about sin as we find it in this, these five chapters, there's probably someone here who can say, yes, but, Brother Dale. Yeah, yes, but, but did you think of this? Yes, but, how about this? And you can bring up a contradictory thought or a contrasting view on almost anything that is said. You can hardly make a, in an audience like this, you can hardly make any kind of statement about sin without someone feeling that it was not properly presented. I'm very well aware of that. I'm very conscious of how that works. But I would say let's give John a chance. He says a tremendous amount about sin. There are a few people that say more. He mentions sin nearly 30 times in this letter. It's called sin sometimes. It's called unrighteousness two times. But the, the word unrighteousness there comes from the same Greek word that sin comes from that's in this book on several occasions. So we're in John chapter 1, we read verse 7. But if we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship one with another, and the blood of Jesus Christ, his Son, cleanseth us from all sin. That's where the title comes from, cleansed from all sin. So these are not words that I invented. Now you have to take issue with John here, not with me. You have to take issue with the Holy Spirit of God that gave these words to the apostle. But if we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship one with another in the blood of Jesus Christ, his son, cleanseth us from all sin. Then drop down to verse 9 and it says, If we confess our sins, it's plural here, singular in 7 and plural here in 9, he is, un, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins, plural again, and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. That's one of two times that unrighteousness is used in the book of John. And this is a truth that we can scarcely believe. We just read two verses there that, that are maligned and spoken against. Contradictory thoughts come up. 
We try to find some way to discredit the validity of these statements. We don't want to take them for what they say. We certainly cannot believe them as they're written here. We can scarcely believe it. We have not experienced this. We see little of this in the lives of others that we know. There's probably no one in this assembly tonight that would boldly stand up and proclaim, I am humble. Nor would we dare to say, I am sinless. Yet here's one called Jesus. And he's called Jesus because the Bible says he will save his people from their sins. And his precious blood does more than cover us, which is what the blood did of wolves and of goats. But it cleanses us, and as it says here, from all sin. And perhaps few there are who believe this, yet for John there can be no doubt about it. John did not have any hesitation to, to write what he said here. I'm going to say a couple of introductory things about sin as we find it in this letter of John or this message from John before I go into the few points of this message tonight. I'm saying this because I want to help us understand sin as John understands it. As, uh, and excuse me, here's where some human thought comes into play here. I'm, I'm doing this with my limited understanding. I'm not reading someone's commentary. I didn't read anyone's book. I didn't read John MacArthur or John Piper. I didn't read Max Lucado. I didn't read anyone's commentaries. I didn't read... This is... No thoughts that are here come from anything else. It's just for meditation. That's, that's all. And so... What's faulty here, I'm not, I'm not going to give credit to anybody else. I'm not quoting anybody tonight. This is an attempt to try to help you understand something that's extremely important. There are all kinds of things I can say about sin, and I don't know how many of these things John had in mind when he writes, because I will, I will admit this to you, that when I read John's writing on sin, some of the things seem contradictory. At times it seems like he's saying, sin is there. Don't deny it. At times it seems like he's saying, you're completely free from it. So how are we supposed to understand John? And, and, and so here you have a faulty person trying to, under, trying to understand perfection, trying to understand Holy Spirit illumination, trying to understand a perfect representation of, of, of God's will as revealed here in this scripture, you have a limited mind and limited experience trying to figure this out. So I'm going to say a couple things about sin. This is the first thought. And these thoughts then are what these to guide us and keep this in mind as we're reading what John says here. I suppose it would be easy to think that a person is sinless, it'd probably be easy to think that I'm free from all sin. It'd probably be easy for me to think that I've got this all mastered if I was living at great distance from the light about which we just sang this evening, immortal, invisible, God only wise. Regardless of how much I feel like I've accomplished, how much great ground I feel like I've gained, if I would live closer to the presence and the light and the glory and the blazing perfection of Christ, I would find out just who I am. And so I believe that's why it's not, not easy, not right for a person as Christian as they are, as holy as they are, as careful as they're walking with God, as nearly as they are emulating him, to rise up and say, I've attained it. I did hear one say many years ago, that a Christian is a person who sins less and less and confesses more and more. And I think the reason why we do that is because we become increasingly conscious of how holy God is and of how we truly are in his presence. Isaiah never would have said what he said in Isaiah 6. If you wouldn't have had that very fresh vision of the holiness of God. But when he came close there, he saw himself. 
I think that's one of the things we must keep in mind as we read John tonight and as we worship the Lord in this week of meetings. It's easy to be calloused, easy to be carnal, easy to allow room for self when we're living so far from God that we don't catch that blazing glory that would show us, Dale, I don't accept that in your life. That's one reason I like to surround myself with Christians who are further along in their development than what I am. It's it's helpful to uh, see a life more nobly lived than what mine has been. And help me understand that there's room for attainment and growth that I've not yet experienced. Do we sin? Does a Christian ever sin? If one is truly redeemed, is John trying to tell us here that he will never sin then? John comes very close to suggesting that Christians are sinless. But am I understanding him correctly? And when we listen to John, we can see sin as it is used in Scripture several times, as it comes from this Greek word anomia. That word means lawlessness or rebellion or wickedness. And this sin in our lives as Christians should be broken. The power of that should be broken. You might have all kinds of mistakes of myself in my life. Many things we wish were improved. We are disappointed in ourselves. We are disappointed in others. We see mistakes made and and evidences of fallenness that we wish were perfected. But dear brothers and sisters, tonight we can live without rebellion in our lives. We can live without this desire to confront God. And say, that's what you said, but I'm against it. And, and that power should be broken. That, that, to live a Christian life, that's one thing we are free from. And when D- Romans chapter 6 mentions being free from sin, and that chapter only uses sin... In its singular sense, it's not talking about deeds you did or I did. It's talking about this principle of anomia, this principle of wickedness, this principle of lawlessness. I will not have this man rule over me. You have no authority in my life. I make those decisions. Don't you know who I am? That's broken. That's gone. John believes that. We should believe that. That's one thing that should be taking care of in our lives. Even though at times we fail, that power of rebellion against God is gone. John knows that the possibility of sin is ever with us. That is to say, there, there, there are possibilities, there are latent possibilities in us that the tempter knows about that he's, he can tempt us. That, and, and how could I be tempted if it would be impossible for me to ever do anything wrong? I, I could never do anything wrong. I, 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 it'll never happen to me. I, I will come through with perfection every time. Well, then there's no temptation then. But we yield ourselves to God Instead of yielding ourselves to the temptation, God is there. Even as we are being tempted, God is there and offers us this other opportunity. Dale, look over here. I'm right here. I'm not far away. I'm as available to you as you what was what you need. Come to me right now. Don't, don't, don't go that way. I'm right here. The Spirit of God is within us. John is convinced of that. We're abiding in Christ. His life is right here. The life is in the Son. That life is available to us. That life is as much ours at this moment of difficult need and struggle as whatever it was before. And we don't need the life of Christ when everything's perfect and going well and we are in some heavenly place up there in the mountaintop. But dark days come and difficult moments come and we need the life of Christ. You see the door. That I I pass through. Here's the door. I don't know what's on the other side here. But if I'm living in faith, 
I'm living in the light of God. I'm, I'm living in the presence of the Lord. I'm living, abiding in Him. I know that right now I'm in the vine, and the vine is in me. The life, the sap, the present, the, the life of the Son is in my heart. And I'm living this faith. And that door it opens, and I pass from this door. I threw it on the other side, immediately on the other side of that threshold, the other side of that door jam. There's flesh. And right away, I'm on my own with this my own capacity. I, I, this faith connects you with God, this abiding in the Lord. I dropped it. I left it. I walked away from it. I walked through that door and went to the other side. And immediately over there, John's concerned about that, that we don't do that. She said, I'm writing to you so that you don't do that. I think of these beautiful words there in Romans. And this is not, John did not write this. Paul did. He said in verse 12 of chapter 6, Let not sin therefore reign in your mortal body. That sin there is an anomia, rebellion, as it is in John in Romans chapter 6. In verse 14 it says, For shit, sin shall not have dominion over you. That, that rebellion, that wickedness, that iniquity, that being against the law of God and authority in life should never be part of a Christian experience. We do not live in sin. That's what John is trying to tell us. But though we may do wrong, we do not continue the practice of sin. We do not come under its dominion. And then I wrote something in the board with which I want to end this meditation this evening. It says up there that love is the countervailing force to sin. And maybe you don't know what that means. I'll just say, explain it very, very briefly at this point so that we have a little foundation here with which we enter into this message. Supposing there's a 16-year-old boy in this congregation tonight. I suppose there might be some of that age here. I don't know. Supposing that boy's mother is sitting in the same congregation, and I don't have any examples here right now. I don't know who that might be, who the mother might be, nor the son. Maybe the son was on the street today. Maybe he was driving his car, vehicles, his pickup truck. I don't know where he would have been today, what, what his work was, where he was traveling. Something may have happened in that young man's life today which is devastating to him, left him very defeated, left him feeling as if he failed today, miserably failed. Are you listening? He comes home from work, parks the truck, goes in the house and meets mother in the kitchen. Walks up to mother and he's kind of quiet. A little hard for him to say what's on his mind. Doesn't know if he should say anything or not to his mother. He says, Mama, something happened today. I thought I'd like to tell you about it. The poor boy's having a hard job finding words. He doesn't know how to say this. He's ashamed of himself. He's somewhat scared. He's not quite sure his mother's going to respond. And he just finds himself with the grace, with the humility, with the brokenness to just be vulnerable. And he says it. This is what happened today, Mama. And Mother walks up to that boy and wraps her arms around him and holds him tight and says, My precious son, my precious son, thank you, my son. I'm going to tell you something. Mother, if you keep your arms around that boy, if you keep on holding him, if you can keep on feeling that love, filling his heart, he'll never sin as long as you're doing that. Because sin will only happen when he forgets that and loses that, doesn't sense that, he's not aware of that, loses his vision for that, not experiencing that. But no one sins when love is flowing through their heart. Love is the countervailing force to sin.
And that's what John believes. He spends a large part of this message, almost all of chapter 3 and chapter 4 and the first part of chapter 5, discussing that point. The place, the importance of love in the Christian life. John believes that we can be cleansed from all sin and from all unrighteousness. We have that in chapter 1. I read those verses twice. Or two verses like that, I mean to say. We didn't have time this week to explain all that the righteousness of God consists of. It'd be an interesting study. That's a message by itself. What is the righteousness of God? But John is keenly aware... that we are to be free from all unrighteousness and filled with that righteousness of God. What is John saying in verses 5 through 10? And I'm going to take you on just a little short journey here. This is not going to take real long, so don't worry about it. And I'm going to tell you what we're going to find before we get there so that you understand what's going on in verses 5 through 10. That's six verses. 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10. In those five verses, in those six, in those six verses, we have Three sets of thoughts, three spiritual truths. In each case, the first verse, now we're, we're going to talk about verse 5 in just a moment, tell, gives us a, a spiritual reality, a spiritual truth as John understands it, a spiritual truth as John wants us to believe it. And then in the next verse, we have a carnal heart or someone who is not living close to God as he should be, someone who has not believed that as John wants him to, answering and saying, if we say. It's the response of a person who's not speaking the way he should speak. Not answering the way he should answer. Not answering by faith. Not answering because he believes what John said in that spiritual truth that he gave. And so we have that three times. In verse 5, a truth. In verse 6, an answer. In verse 7, a truth. In verse 8, an answer. In verse 9, a truth. In verse 10, an answer. But the answer is not right. Now let's look at it. Verses 5 and 6. This that is the message, and each one of these has to do with sin. This that is the message which we have heard of him and declare unto you that God is light and in him is no darkness at all. There's none there. It's only light. We've been hearing about that this week. If we say, if we say, don't say it, don't say it, but if we say, that we have fellowship with him and walk in darkness, we lie and do not the truth. We sin. So we have the spiritual truth here and the all too common response. Lying is sin. See, we, not, we do not only know the truth. You're not a Christian this evening just because we know the truth, but because we do the truth. They do not the truth. They lie and do not the truth. Because we say we have fellowship with him, but we're walking in darkness. So it cannot be because God is light. The truth said that in verse 5. There's no darkness at all. God is light. How can I walk in darkness then? Let's look at verses 7 and 8. But if we walk in the light as he is in light, as the spiritual truth. We have fellowship one with another in the blood of Jesus Christ. His son cleanseth us from all sin. This is a promise. It's a truth. It's a reality. It's, it's, the, it's one of the most important aspects of fellowship that there is. But someone says something in verse 8. Look what they say. If we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. And that makes us sound like there's sin in here. And we are sinning then. Verse 8 is not telling us to sin. It is not justifying sin in our lives. We are all well aware of all that is within us that is so unlike the holy life of Christ. Instead of denying our need, instead of saying, I'm perfect, I've attained it, look, where I, look who I am, I, I'm at the top of the ladder, I've ascended, like that man said today, living on the 33rd floor. Instead of doing that, 
Instead of acting like that, instead of lifting yourselves up and say, look how I've attained. Look, look, look where I am in this great development of Christian life and experience. Look, look where I'm at. If you want to end the sentence with a preposition. Instead of denying our need, we choose delight. We choose fellowship. We flee not only to Jesus Christ, but we flee to our brothers, as verse 7 tells us to do. If we walk in the light as his in light, we have fellowship one with another, and the blood of Jesus Christ, his son, cleanseth us from all sin. We're walking in the light. We have fellowship with each other. You can simply start some of the church, hold a songbook, and share the same page, and sing the same notes, and sing the same words without being in fellowship with that person that's sitting right beside you. There, there might be no fellowship there at all. If I'm unwilling to let you know the struggles I have in life, if I'm unwilling to let you know the weaknesses are in my heart, if I'm unwilling to let you discover the imperfections that there are in my life, if I'm unwilling for you to know that, there's something dark in my life that I'm hiding from you, and that, to that extent, I cannot have fellowship with you because I'm faking it. I'm, I'm not letting you know the truth about myself. And since I have that darkness and that hiddenness in my life, and you're not allowed to enter into that, you're not allowed to be part of that, I keep that from you. I resist that. I reserve that for myself. I don't let you find that out. Something's missing in my life. There's a cleansing. There's a purification. There's something very, very holy that would be happening to me that's not happening. So if we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. Verse 9 is the spiritual truth. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness, and that is very powerful. But we answer in verse 10, and look at what we say. If we say we have not sinned, we make him a liar, and his word is not in us. We recognize instead that we are needy. We are faulty. We're very faulty creatures. We have leaky vessels. We heard that last night. Or was that, that was two nights ago. That was on Tuesday night. We recognize that we have sinned. We are in need. We're in need of that forgiveness and of that cleansing. We need it. I want to say this about verses 9 and verse 7, comparing the two of them together. Verse 9 in, in, in the Greek tense, in the Greek language, is instantaneous. If we confess our sins, he's faithful to us, forgive us our sins. That doesn't happen next week. That happens right now. When you confess something to God, it's now. It's taken care of now. He, he doesn't hold that off and say, sit out on the porch for a while, see where you're at in six months. We do that to each other, but God doesn't do that to us. That forgiveness is instantaneous. And to cleanse us from all unrighteousness, that's right now. I did that for you. After David prayed that prayer in Psalm 51, and I showed you what God did about that. He cleansed that man, and th 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 this eraser, God used it. And, and whatever is written on David's account there, and in the eternal record, it was erased off. And, and God couldn't think of any time that David had ever made a mistake. He couldn't think of any time he ever said. He couldn't think of any time that he didn't completely fulfill his righteousness and his will in his life. God couldn't think of it because he had this thing here was busy because David confessed. That's instantaneous. But verse 7 is different. If we walk with the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship one with another, and the blood of Jesus Christ, his son, cleanseth us from all sin. That's not instantaneous. That is continuous. That keeps on happening. It's, it's, it's as if the washing machine is always running. How can you wear a pair of overalls if you're working in the mud or in the dirt or in the trench or wherever you are and have it being washed all the time as, you're, as it's happening. It, it, it's as if those pants, those trousers can't get dirty because they're continually in, 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 in soap and water and being washed in that warm water there and spinning around in that washing machine. 
And here we are in this wicked world. And here we are with sin all around us. And here we are touching this evil and coming in contact with it. And being continually cleansed. And why? Because we're in fellowship with each other. And with Jesus Christ the Son. And that cleansing is going on all the time. This is how John understands sin. This is how John understands the Christian life. Fresh water is flowing into a putrid vessel. If this, if this thing here would have, and, and I got one of these boys to go out there and get me uh, some dirt out of the ground out there. And I put dirt in here. And, this, and no one wants to drink it. But I take this to a fresh spigot, and there's a spring of water, fresh water coming into this thing, and that water is continually running into here. And tell me, son, tell me, daughter, tell me, young man and young lady, how long will that dirt stay in there? With that fresh water running in all the time. It'll, it'll soon just look like that. Fresh water flowing into a putrid, putrid vessel. We hear it. We come to believe it. We desire it. We hunger and thirst for this righteousness. We want to live that way. We say, dear Lord, I know I'm imperfect. I know I'm not there. I know that I'm far from it. I have no idea how far from that holy standard I am. I don't have no idea how long it will take me to come close to attaining anything like this. But if I can't get there, I'm on the way there. If I'm not living tonight, that's the direction I'm going. That's the way we go. It's the way a holy man thinks. Whether he's right at times or wrong at times, it's the direction he wants to go. And we have to have that in our hearts. We have it in our hearts, don't we? We don't need to start that tonight. We have that there ready, don't we? And we pursue it. Perhaps, dear people, tonight this is so holy, it's hardly fit to say it. We pursue it tonight, perhaps, without being fully aware of the holy work that's already taking place in us and not aware of the changes that are already coming, not aware of the growth that's already there, not aware of what God is already doing, and not aware of what other people are seeing. And, we, and we, faith pursues her way until the crown is won. I would say this, that sinlessness to the Christian life, I, I wish I could call it an attainment. I wish I could call it something we reached. I wish I could call it something that we're all experiencing. But I can say this to you tonight. It's a direction that we all are choosing to travel. That's the way I'm going. That's what John's talking about. I hope that makes sense to somebody. But please, may God help us understand that. God has made provision for our spiritual cleansing. Look at chapter 2, verse 1. My little children, these things write unto you that ye sin not. And if any man sin, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ, the righteous, and he is the perpetuation for our sins, and not for ours only, but also for the sins of the whole world. If you don't know what perpetuation means, it's okay. I, I don't mind if you don't know. But I can make it easy for you if you go back to the tabernacle, back behind that veil, and there's an Ark of the Covenant back there. And there's a box there. And in that box there, for a while, were three things. Later on, they weren't all in there. I don't know when they left. But there was a pot of money in there and rods of butter. There were those tables of stone. And then above this box, you have a cap on there with a crown around the outside. And that is called a mercy seat. And on top of that mercy seat, you have two seraphims. You have two angels. They're angelic beings. And they're above that. And they're looking down in that mercy seat. And there's blood down there. And everyone's looking at what Christ did. Looking at the work of Christ. The shedding of the blood of Christ. It's on there. Every year it was put on there. He's our propitiation. He's our mercy seat. Mercy for the sinner. Mercy for Dale. Mercy for you. Sin separates from God. Sin grieves the Holy Spirit of God. Sin counts the blood of the covenant wherewith we were satisfied in no holy, old, old holy thing. And, and it's, it says that Christ's blood is insufficient to cleanse us, insufficient to make us holy, insufficient to make us right, insufficient. 
Yet God is rich in mercy. There's that perpetuation. There's that mercy seat. John's purpose is that we sin not. But you and I can walk by flesh instead of by faith. We can be overcome in this life. We can forget our position in Christ. We can forget that we're abiding in him. We can forget that we have his life available to us. We can forget that he's even now living in, within us and at the same time ever making intercession for us. And with that disconnect, we can walk right into temptation. And yet if that ever happens in your life and mine, there's a potocletos, there's an advocate, there's a lawyer, there's a defense attorney, Jesus Christ, the righteous. He is our perpetuation. He is our mercy seat. Before the throne, my surety stands. My name is written on his hands. His blood avails for all the race and sprinkles now the throne of grace. Not only for our personal sins, but for those of the whole world. Is Jesus your lawyer tonight? Have you asked him? Have you made an arrangement with him? Walk with me in this life. I will surely stumble. I make a lot of mistakes. I'm very faulty. I'll never get through this by myself. Would you hold me? Hold me up. Keep me from falling. Present me faultless. Would you walk with me? This is what John is teaching us tonight. This is not forensic righteousness. This is a relationship, a union of faith and love with Christ. Wash your robes tonight to make them white in the blood of the Lamb. He calls them little children. Why does he call them little children? In this chapter 2, it's because their sins are forgiven. What does forgiven mean? It means they are sent away. They are gone. They're not there. Look for them. They can't find them. Not only the, not only the guilt, but the sin itself. Not only the devastating consequences, but the power of sin is broken in the life. So God has made provision for our spiritual cleansing. We have Jesus Christ, the righteous. We have him interceding for us. We have him, his blood atoning for all our race. We have his mercy seat. We have his blood cleansing us from all sin. But we must want it. We must choose it. We must claim it as our own. We must put our lives there. We must put our, my faith will lay her hands on that dear head of thine. Here while like a penitent I stand and here confess my sin. This is how hymn writers explain what John is talking about here. John knows that a believing Christian does not practice sin. You can go to chapter 3 now, if you will. I'm going to read verses 4 through 10. A believing Christian does not practice sin. Verse 4, whosoever committeth sin, practices sin, stays in sin, lives in sin, cannot get free from sin, is always sinning. He that committeth sin keeps on doing it. That's, that's, that's a, a progressive tense. Keeps on doing it. Lives in it. Transgresseth also the law, for sin is the transgression of the law. And you know that he was manifested to take away our sins, and in him is no sin. Whosoever abideth in him sinneth not, does not keep on practicing sin. Whosoever keeps on sinning and sinning and keeps on practicing it, hath not seen him, neither known him. I'm, I'm doing that with these verbs, sinneth, because that's what it means in Greek. Little children, let no man deceive you. He that doeth righteousness is righteous, even as he is righteous. And I read that to you in chapter 2, verse 1. I advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ, the righteous. He that doeth righteousness is righteous even as he is righteous. He that committeth sin, practices sin, keeps on living in it is of the devil. For the devil sinneth, keeps on doing it, doesn't stop doing it, lies, keeps on doing it, father of it, passes it on, gets you to do it. He gets, he gets Adam and Eve to lie. For the devil sinneth from the beginning. For this purpose the Son of God was manifested that he might destroy the works of the devil. Whosoever is born of God doth not commit sin. Doesn't keep on practicing it. Doesn't keep on doing it. Why not? For his seed, that holy seed of God, remaineth in him. And he cannot sin. He can't keep on doing it because he's born of God. In this, the children of God are manifest or revealed or made known and the children of the devil. 
Whosoever doeth not righteousness is not of God, neither he that loveth not his brother. I, you will see in John time and again that sin and love are put together. Love is the countervailing force to sin. So chapter 4 is the first definition of sin found in this sermon, found in these five chapters. Sin is the transgression of the law, it says here. He speaks here of committing sin. Yet see verse 5. He was manifest to take away our sins, and in him is no sin, and he is our life. When Christ, who is our life, shall appear, then shall we also appear with him in glory. There's not only is there no sin in Christ, but he takes the sin away that's in you and me. That's what his name Jesus means, for he shall save his people from their sins. Verse 6 makes two very sp significant spiritual statements. Here in verse 6. The practice of sinning means that we do not truly know him. Whosoever abideth in him sinneth not. Whosoever sinneth hath not seen him, neither known him. The answer to the, for the practice of sinning is abiding in Christ. Then when you jump down to 7, verse 7 takes us back to uh, chapter 2, verse 1, Jesus Christ the righteous, even as he is righteous. I want you to see the contrast between verse 7 and verse 8. Look at it again. Little children, let no man deceive you. He that doeth righteousness is righteous, even as he Christ is righteous. He that committeth sin is of the devil. Great contrast here. The works of the devil, dear people, tonight are destroyed in the holy transaction that takes place between us and God in the repentance of our hearts towards him, a repentant heart towards God and the forgiveness that God offers to us. For that reason, Jesus was able to look at people and say these words. Listen to this. This is Jesus' words. I'm sorry. You say, I don't believe it, Dale. I don't think it's possible. But Jesus told people these words. Go and sin no more. Because we live in this constant relationship with Christ between our repentant, our humble, our broken, our meekness, our surrendered hearts, and his continual cleansing and forgiving and mercy and grace poured into our hearts. So we live in that constant union, that constant transaction, this heart always with that attitude towards God, and God always with that attitude towards us. Go and sin no more. That's how it's possible. That's the only way it's possible. John understands that. And as I hear thoughts like this, it makes my heart very hungry. It gives me a tremendous desire to experience something like that. What a beautiful relationship. And this is not just happening between Dale and God. It's happening between us and God. We are in this together. This is what a church is. This is what fellowship is. This is not a place to come to church. This is not a place to go to a revival meeting. This is a relationship that we have with each other and with God. And John is saying that this thing works when we're doing this together, experiencing this thing together. Should I, Brother Joseph, should I ask this question or not? Should I lay this out here in this auditorium this evening on a Thursday night? Should I take the risk and say this? Is it safe at those dark men in that church to do wrong? Is it safe to have made a serious mistake? Is it safe to come here and say, brothers, look at what I did? Is it safe to come here and say, 
something serious happened in my life, and this is what took place. May I tell you about it? How will this church respond to that? If no one is free to say, if no one is free to come, if no one is free to open that up, if no one is free to bring that out, if no one is free to recognize that, it might be because they already know what's going to happen if they do. I'm showing you how John understands fellowship. I'm showing you how John understands how church works. This is the best filter you can find for taking care of the wrongs and mistakes in life right here in this fellowship. This is where it happens. This is where cleansing takes place. This is, this is where the light shines. This is where this must happen in our lives, right here, in our church. Would you please help me find a church like that? Would you please get my wife and my children and grandchildren and great-grandchildren into a church like that? Dear God, would you please give us churches like that? Would you raise up churches like that, dear God? In Tennessee, the Missouri, and anywhere else. We cannot continue living in sin and have the Holy Spirit keeping us at the same time. There's holy seed in this life. There's a holy one lives here. There's a dwelling place of a holy one here. Dale, what did you do there? Why did you say it like that? Dale, where does that attitude come from? Dale, are you being redemptive? Is that the way you should think about that brother, that sister? Holy Spirit does not let us practice sin, does not, let it keep, keep us, does not allow us to continue living in it. Oh, Holy Spirit, come. Abide with me. Keep me from falling. You see, dear ones, it's like this. If you look at one of these lakes, one of these little farm ponds that you have all scattered all around this square that you live around here, you see a duck in the water. I just was up there in Canada. There's lakes up there. There's puddles of water. They were filled with Canadian geese. I understand a goose being in the water. I understand a duck being in the water. They want to be there. They feel good there. They live there. That's the way they do. But if I go over to Murray Schruck's house or David Miller's place, and find one of those chickens out there in his yard, out there in those acreage, in a farm pond, I know they fell in, but they don't want to be in there. They fell in, but they don't want to be in there. If they could get out of there, they'd get out. If they'd have a way to get out of there, they'd get out. They might be drowning, floundering, flopping around with their wings all wet, soaked, trying to get out of there. They said heavier and heavier and heavier, than the water is soaking them down and, and, and barely can keep their, their head out of the water. But if they're in there, it's because if they fell in, because not because they wanted to be in there. And if a Christian finds himself in the wrong place, it's because they fell in. Anybody wants out? Do you believe that? He might be in there. He doesn't want to be in there. Don't understand sin that way. In the life of a Christian, we make mistakes sometimes, don't we, brothers and sisters? Maybe you don't. They do in Tennessee. So we learn a righteous response instead of a flesh response. Tell me, where did Joseph learn to respond rightly instead of wrongly? Where did Daniel learn it? Where did the three Hebrew children learn it? Jesus, come and be my righteousness and plant that seed in my heart. So I desire it and move towards it and live because of it and take my life that direction. Bring it to me, Lord Jesus. Tonight, bring it to me, that righteousness of God. So love is a countervailing force for sin. It counters it and cancels it and overcomes it. 
Love cannot sin. Love never sins. I, I don't sin against anybody when I love them. If the blood of Jesus Christ cleanses us from all sin, then it is his love that empowers the holy response in the stresses and temptations of life. If we are filled with love, only love will come out. That's what will come out if that's what I'm filled with. We see that in Stephen. I be chapter 4, I'd like to read verses 7 through 11. Beloved, let us love one another. For love is of God, and everyone that loveth is born of God and knoweth God. He that loveth God not knoweth not God, for God is love. In this was manifest the love of God towards us, because that God sent his only begotten Son into the world that we might live through him. Here in his love, not that we love God, but that he loved us and sent his Son to be the perpetuation for our sins. Beloved, if God so loved us, we ought also to love one another in that same way. To know God is to know love. Our problem tonight is we have not allowed God to love us. The problem with that 16-year-old boy is if he does not allow his mother to love him. The problem with that 16-year-old boy is if he is not willing for his mother to find out that he has need so that she is allowed, he permits her to minister to his need. He'll face that thing by himself. He will brace up. I'll try better tomorrow. It won't happen tomorrow. He makes resolutions. He makes some adjustments in his schedule. He avoids a certain place he had stopped into the night before. He tries to somehow or another fix this up on his own. He's not going to be successful. He's going to fail. He fails until he is loved, until love comes. And the quicker we allow someone that can help me, someone who appreciates me, someone that I desperately need in my life to love me, the quicker I will find victory in this area of struggle in my life. John understands that. A mother is a beautiful filter, a beautiful answer for the temptations and struggles that young men have these days. So our problem tonight is that we will not allow someone to love us, not even God. So I cannot love my wife as I would. I do not love the brotherhood as I should because I must first receive love. So I will try to earn it. I'll try to prove to you how good I am. I will try to prove to you how much you need me. I will try to prove to you what kind of advantage it is for you to have me in your church. I will try to prove to you how well I can do. I will try to impress you with my capabilities and contributions. But I will not allow you to love me. I'm too proud for that. I'm too big for that. I don't need your love. I I'm very capable without you. I'm living in sin. I'm hiding it. I'm defeated. It'll all change if I would humble that and get that out in the light and say, this is who I am, dear people, tonight. Would you please help me in my life? The young man came to Jesus and said, what good things shall I do that I may inherit eternal life? That's not the way you get it, my son. That's not where you get it, rich, rich young ruler. But you think you can do it. You can brace up and face it. You will prove that you need no one's help, that you're more than able. But life is a mess. No one is cleansed with sin, from sin without love. Then John ends this message with the deepest and most comprehensive definition of sin found anywhere in the Bible. It's found in chapter 5. Being cleansed from all sin is victory over this world. And we skipped over that in chapter 2. Love not the world, neither the things that are in this world. If any man love the world, the love of the Father is not in him. For all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh and the lust of the eyes and the pride of life is not of the Father, but is of the world. And the world passeth away, and the lust thereof. But he that doeth the will of God abideth forever. 
The answer is to be light in this world and be in the light in this world. Separation from the world is not merely by doing things differently from what the world does, but by being cleansed and set free from sin, the sin of the world. And while others are trapped in it and living in it and mesmerized by it, finding some way to harmonize themselves or bring themselves into alliance with it, the Christian is different. He's got light shining in this candle in his lampstand, in his, in his lantern. The light shining in that darkness. The darkness cannot put it out. There's a testimony there, and Christ is there, and there's a life there. And people see that life, and they see that light, and they sense that salt, and they know there's something different going on here. I read verses 16 through 19 of chapter 5. If any man see his brother's sin, his sin which is not unto death, he shall ask, and he shall give that as God, shall give him life for them that sin not unto death. And it says here that there is a sin unto death. I do not say he shall pray for it, and tonight I'm not going to take you into that journey. I'm not talking about that unique dimension that John puts in here. But I want you to notice verse 17. Please look at it in your Bible. All unrighteousness is sin. That's the most comprehensive definition for sin found anywhere in the Bible. Every time my life does not reflect the righteousness of God, something is wrong. And that's not only because I did something wrong. That's what it says back in chapter 3 and verse 4. I did something wrong. I transgressed the law. God's law said this, but I disobeyed it. But that's not all that sin is. Sin is unrighteousness. Sin is what I could have done that I didn't do. Sin is the reflection of God's glory that was not seen. Sin is, at times, the sin of omission. I could have done this, but I didn't. I knew to do good, but I did it not. I knew to speak. I knew to help. I knew to understand. I knew to pray. I knew to intercede. I knew that that should be ministered to. That person should be visited. That person should be understood. Someone should take time. And listen to that heart. Not me. I'm too busy. I got other things, I got other things going. All unrighteousness is sin. And you compare yourself with the righteousness of Jesus. That's why I said early on this evening that we must be careful. When we think we've attained and we're just doing perfectly well, we're living too far from God, and we get close to that righteousness, that glory, that eternal glory of God, and I see something in myself. The solution for sin is found in verse 19 and, and, and verse 20 and 21. And we know that the Son of God has come and hath given us an understanding that we may know him that is true and we are in him that is true, even in his Son, Jesus Christ. This is the true God in eternal life. Little children, keep yourselves from idols. Don't let the world allure you, draw you, but love is a countervailing force to sin. Sixteen-year-old girl tonight, what evidence do you have of your daddy's love for you? Sixteen-year-old boy, what evidence do you have of your mother's love for you tonight? My guess is at this church you have Sunday school classes. I don't know, but my guess is that. My guess is that every Sunday morning they dismiss this thing, primary, intermediate, junior. I don't know what you've got. Youth, there go the youth. Remember the... I think downstairs it says that the youth girls' class is different from the youth boys' class. You have this thing really divided up. Here, here's the, uh, the, the ladies' class. Here's the men's class. So you're sitting in the youth girls' class down here in this basement on Sunday morning. And you're struggling with something in your life. You know very well it's not going well. You know what novel you read that week. You know what you were watching on YouTube. You know very well what movie you were looking at. You know very well what kind of social media you were, was entertaining you. You know the effect it had in your life. You know where you're at with that thing. You're sitting in a youth girls class. And you're saying, she does it too. Yes, yeah, she showed me what she was looking at. We shared it together. We spent two hours looking at it. You got a defeated church. 
you're finished. There's no love there. There's no countervailing force to sin there. It's going downhill rapidly. It's only a matter of time this will coast to a stop, then start going backwards. Let's, re let's revisit that classroom. You know, lady sitting there with a burdened heart. The teacher is ready to be in the class. And he hears the cracking voice of the sobs of the young lady sitting in that youth girl's class. The teacher gets quiet, looks and notices that someone's having a struggle here. Tell me, Mary. Tell me, Alice. Tell me, Stephanie. Is something wrong that we could help you with? And before the girls have a chance to answer, the teacher begins praying out loud, asking for the grace and mercy of God to come for all of our hearts to be in a position to be able to help, to understand, to love, to care for a dear person that's having a problem. The prayer is now ended. This young lady has the grace and humility, the quietness of heart to tell that class what is going on. And very soon those girls get out of their seats. They come around her and put their hands on her and some are crying and some are praying. Someone starts to sing a hymn. Can you imagine the future of a church like that? Can you imagine the power? Can you imagine the life, life and the love? Can you imagine where that's going to go? And brothers and sisters, that's the church I want to be a part of. Because love is the countervailing force to sin, and John knew that. And that's why he wrote to us with this full assurance of faith. We make mistakes in this life, brothers and sisters. We, we fail, we stumble, when our knees come up bloody, and we have all kinds of things to make right. Is Ozark Mennonite Church a safe place to do it? What are you going to do with me if I confess to you and let you find out how many struggles I have in life? What would you do with me? And may you cultivate this kind of fellowship in this church. And may there be a desire among everyone present here tonight that he who cometh to me, I will no wise cast out. I won't throw any sticks or stones at anybody that's facing a struggle. Young man there with that gray shirt, would you come up here? And I close with this illustration. He doesn't know this is going to happen. He has no idea what I'm going to do to him. I don't know his name nor his age, but you tell me. Alden, 14 years old. So you, you turn around here, we can look at these people. And they're not going to hurt you because no one's going to touch you out there. But this boy here just did something terribly wrong. In this illustration. So he's down on his knees. And he puts his head down on the floor. And I, in my concern for Alden, I notice the condition he's in. And you see what's going on with this fella here. And you hear what he did. I can't be part of a church like that. I must be part of this church. And you decide tonight, you're sitting there, look, look, looking at me. And you're going to make a decision right now. And I'm part of this church right here.
and you decide. That's a superlative difference. There's hope for that young man if that's the way we do it. It'll go better for him tomorrow than it did yesterday because love is a countervailing force to sin. And you can dismiss us tonight with prayer, Brother Joseph.